Good evening. It is my good fortune to introduce Larry Heineman, our guest author this evening. He was originally scheduled to read in September of last year, but the college and much of Houston was without power because of Hurricane Ike. So we are grateful to Mr. Heineman for his flexibility in joining us today. Please welcome Larry Heineman. Uh, a couple of disclaimers, probably. Uh, for those of you in the room who have uh, uh, trouble with uh, salty language, uh, please be warned. Uh, the story is told from the point of view of ordinary soldiers, uh, using ordinary soldiers' language. So, uh, uh, well, you're warned. <laughs> what I thought I'd do is, uh, 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 the book was started uh, in a writing class. I'd finished my first novel, Close Quarters, and simply to generate writing, uh, I sat in on a, uh, uh, sat in on a writing class. And the first night of class, uh, the teacher did what uh, the, the assignment was called a letter story. The room is old enough to have gotten at least one really dynamite overland letter. I mean, we're not talking about email. That's 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 a different that's that, that's a different species. Uh, <coughs> the trick is, and this is the point. You put the letter in an envelope, no matter how far the letter has to go, no matter how long it takes the letter to get there. And this is the thing that, uh, that every writer cherishes. No matter how far it goes, how long it takes to get there, when the person gets the letter and opens the letter, it's basically being read at the same emotional moment that it's being written. This is the real power of storytelling. This is the power of writing. This, this, you, you can get people to believe anything is satisfied with it. Anyway. The first clean fact. Let's begin with the first clean fact, James. This ain't no war story. War stories are out. One, two, three, and a heave ho into the lake you go with all the other alewife scuzz and foamy harbor scum. But isn't it a pity? All those crinkly, soggy sorts of laid by tellings crowded together as thick and pitiful as street cobbles, floating mushy bellies up like so much moldy shag rub, dead as rusty ass doornails and smelling so peculiar and unchristian. Just isn't it a pity because here and there and yonder among the corpses are some prize-winning leg-pulling daisies, some real pop-in-the-oven muffins, so to speak, some real softly lobbed, easy-out line drives. Now, according to some people, folks do not want to hear about Alpha Company, us grunts, busting jungle and busting cherries from landing zone skater gator to scat man do, wherever that is humping and hauling ass all the way. We used French colonial maps back then, the names of towns and map symbols and elevation lines crinkled and curly-cued and squeezed together as incomprehensible as the Chiricahua dialect of Apache. We never could cipher a goddamn thing on those maps, so absolutely and precisely where Scat Mandu is Tongue cannot tell. But we asked around and followed Lieutenant Stennett's nose, flashing through some fine firefight possibilities, punji pits the size of copper mines, not to mention hog pens and chicken coops, scattering chickens and chicken feathers like so many wood chips. And back to LZ Skater Gator in an afternoon, James, singing snatches of arias and duets from Simon Bocanegra and the Flying Dutchman at the top of our socks. But what we went there for, no one ever told us, and none of us, what was left of us that time, 
ever bothered to ask. Die tonight. And then giggled some more. Paco blinked his eyes slowly, glancing out of the corners as if to say he didn't believe he heard what he knew he heard and shook his head, saying out loud, what do these zips think this is? Some kind of chicken shit Bruce Dern, Michael J. Pollard, John Wayne movie? G.I. die tonight. What kind of a fucked up attitude is that? <laughs> Then he leaned over his sopping wet rucksack in the direction of the smirking giggles, put his hands to his mouth megaphone fashion and said, hawk shit, loud enough for the whole company to hear. Put your money where your mouth is, slope head. Whip it on. Look, base camp Viets couldn't help but look too. Now the Viets worked the PX checkout counters, good looking women who had to put out right smart and regular to keep their jobs. The PX barber shop, where the Viet barbers could run a 35 cent haircut into 650 in 15 minutes. Everything was extra. And the stylishly thatched souvenir shack, where a bandy legged Arvin cripple sold flimsy beer coolers and zippity doodah house cat ashtrays and athletic style jackets that had a map embroidered on the back with the scrolled legend Hot Damn Vietnam. The rest of the company what was left of us that time, laughed at him too. Even though we humped those last 300 meters to the tents up an incline on sloppy, bloody blisters with our teeth gritted and the fraying rucksack straps squeezing permanent grooves in our shoulders. A body never gets used to humping, James. When the word comes, you saddle your rucksack on your back Take a deep breath and set your jaw good and tight, then lean a little forward as though you're walking into a stiff and blunt nor'easter and begin by putting one foot in front of the other. After a good little while, you've got two sharp pains as straight as a die from your shoulders to your kidneys, but there's nothing to do for it but grit your teeth a little harder and keep humping. And swear to God, James, those last 300 meters were the sorriest, goddamnedest 300 motherfuckers in all of Southeast Asia. Captain Courtney Culpepper, who never, who never missed a chance to flash his West Point class ring in your face, that ring the size of a Hamilton Railroad watch, never once sent the trucks to meet us at the gate, said we had humped that far, might as well hump the rest. Uh, just as an aside, uh, I simply do not understand the pleasure that anyone gets from backpacking or camping. <laughs> <laughs> My sincere apologies to anyone in the room. That's, that, that's your hobby. For, from my point of view, a hump is a hump. There's absolutely no reason to put a hundred pounds of stuff you, you, in a bag, strap it to your back, and go walk in the woods. And then it's up and down in the mountains. It's even worse. And then when it comes time to camp, you, 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 you build a camp. And then you, you, you get to sleep on the ground with the bugs. And then in the morning, it takes an hour to make the coffee. My, I swear to God, cross my heart and hope to die. Since 1968, my idea of camping is a rundown holiday inn. <laughs> That's it. I've had enough of hours through the rags and tatters and cafe curtain looking aurora borealis and so forth and such like. Clean as a whistle. Clean as a new car unfucked with and frequency perfect out into God's everlasting cosmos, out where it's hot enough to shrivel your eyeballs to the shape and color and consistency of raisins, out where it's cold enough to freeze your breath to resemble slab plastic. And we're pushing up daisies for half a handful of millennia. We're all pushing up daisies, James until we're powder, finer than talc, finer than fine. 
as smooth and hollow as an old salt lick. But that blood-curdling scream is rattling all over God's ever-loving creation like a BB in a boxcar, only louder. 